about Joe T3 back in the lineup for the dogs, Georgia and Tennessee coming up in just a little bit. Kickoff is going to be eight minutes before the hour. Glad to have you along. I'm Reese Davis mm -hmm. on the day. Who will be able to avoid making errors between the hedges tonight? Eric Ainge leading the balls in against the dogs. Kickoff not too far away. A few minutes, Tennessee and Georgia. What do you think of this one, Lou? I think the University of Tennessee is just too balanced on both offense and defense. I like Tennessee because of their wide receivers. You look at Robert Meachin and Jason Swain, they've been outstanding this year. They're the best duo at this time in the nation. And Eric Ainge completing close to 70% of his passes. But the Dogs getting the emotional lift of having their senior quarterback back in the lineup. Maybe a steadying influence on the offense. The defense has been great. A hard-hitting SEC affair coming from Athens. And Mike Patrick will have the call for us. Thank you, Reese, and welcome to Sanford Stadium in Athens, Georgia. They have been playing football here since the start of the Great Depression in 1929. And over the years, the capacity has grown from 30,000 to the fifth largest in the country, 92,746. Tonight, it's number 13, Tennessee, going between the hedges to face the 10th-ranked Bulldogs of Georgia. It is a packed house in Athens, Georgia, to see the once beaten balls against the undefeated Bulldogs in a huge SEC showdown. Good evening, everybody. Mike Patrick, Todd Blackledge. Great to have you with us. Holly Rowe will join us shortly. This is an underachieving Georgia offense, especially in terms of throwing the football. But to be fair about it, they've had to use three quarterbacks so far this year. Tonight, Joe Tarashinsky, the senior returns. Todd, will that make a difference? I think it can make a difference. I think what Joe T brings to the table is Poise, stability, senior leadership, experience in this offensive system, which should give Mark Richt a lot more confidence to open up the game plan and be aggressive. And really, the burden is on this Georgia offense because for them to have a chance to win tonight, they have to hold their own and take some pressure off of what has been an outstanding Georgia defense. Now, people question, is this 5-0 record legitimate in all of college football? Well, those numbers will certainly be tested tonight right. because Tennessee is averaging 32 points a game, and the offensive coordinator from their glory days David Cutcliffe is back no coincidence and he is the new sheriff in town no question he has changed the way that team thinks their attitude the way they practice and no more are his fingerprints more evident than on their quarterback Eric Ainge and he got with Eric Ainge he challenged him he said you want to be a good quarterback or a great quarterback he started by teaching him defense teaching him how to read film properly then when they got on the field it was mechanics and fundamentals when they finally hit the practice field this August it was how to compete, how to make every practice rep like a game rep. Cutcliffe's touch worked for Peyton Manning and Eli. So far, it's working for Eric Ainge as well. Here are the Tennessee Volunteers coming onto the field, slowly walking out behind the big flag. They have lost one time this year, a heartbreaking loss to the University of Florida. ESPN's College Football Prime Time is broadcast in high definition and presented by Pioneer Plasma Displays. 
Sanford Stadium in Athens, Georgia. If you watch college football every weekend, you come to realize just how important special teams can become in the outcome of games. And Holly Rowe, that may be bad news for Georgia tonight. That's right, Mike. We saw again today how important special teams are. Minnesota loses in overtime after missing a PAT. Clemson blocks the field goal, returns it for a touchdown to change the course of their game against Wake Forest. For Georgia, they are without their all-SEC kicker. Brandon Cajun is out for the season. So in his place, Andy Bailey will kick. Other times awkward and uncomfortable. It's critical how he performs tonight. For Tennessee, they have a tried and true kicker. James Wilhoyt, a senior, hasn't missed an extra point this year and has only missed two in his entire career. We'll see how the kicking game plays out tonight. All right, thanks very much, Holly. And both uh, Ben Wilson and Andy Bailey for Georgia in warm-ups. As you said, they were inconsistent, but both of them able to hit 55-yard field goals, so they both have the leg to do it. How will they do on the accuracy part of it? Ben Wilson, the walk-on sophomore, to kick to Taylor and Coker, 12 and 22. Taylor, Coker wanted him to stay. He comes out and smack down at the 16-yard line. Well, Tennessee averaging 429 yards a game. LaMarcus Coker is the new starting tailback. The best speed gives them some big play options. And outside, Robert Meacham and Jason Swain, the top receiving duo in all of college football. They've combined for 955 yards and 10 touchdowns to start this season. There was a flag down on the kickoff return, and Tennessee is walking back toward its own goal line. Now, Holly mentioned the, on the starting tight end and Steve Shaw, our referee tonight. So that puts Tennessee in a huge hole to start this game. And I think field position is a critical aspect of this game, which is a big part of special teams play. Eric Ames leads them out, hitting almost 70% of his passes this year. Coker, the tailback, standing inside his own one, and he'll get the carry. Nice blocking in front, and Coker up to about the 11-yard line. Josh McNeil, nice job on pulling and getting a block for him. Let's take a look at the starting lineup presented by the U.S. Postal Service. Tennessee's offensive line has to run block well tonight. They cannot afford to be one-dimensional like they were against the University of Florida. Uh, minus 11 yards rushing against Florida. The Gators' front four really controlled the line of scrimmage, and that affected the way Eric Age threw the ball as well. Only one wide receiver. Coker and Anderson together in the backfield. Ainge, good play fake. Wants to go deep and it's overthrown. They had Meacham sandwiched out there. Battle was back. He wasn't going to let anybody behind him. Head tackles behind the line of scrimmage. Meacham, the intended recipient on that second down, averaging over 115 yards a game. That's third in the country as a wide receiver. They'll get a lot of attention tonight. Ains, short toss, Meacham, only picks up a yard, goes out of bounds, they'll have to punt. And one of the first battles in one of the real games within the game, third down, coming into tonight, Tennessee the best in the conference, converting third downs at 60%, Georgia the best on defense, holding their opponents to just under 25%. First third down situation, Georgia wins. Paul Oliver was giving him enough space so he could catch the ball but not get the first down. And now Britton Colt with the fourth of the kicking Colquitts is on to punt. And the dangerous Mikey Henderson is deep. Line drive kick. Henderson at the 48. This guy is cat quick. And then he's buried at the 45-yard line. A return of seven after a 41-yard kick. For Georgia's offense again, he's number one. Craig Lumpkin coming off his first career start as the tailback. Lumpkin gets the ball. Cuts to the outside and a nice solid tackle by the corner. Jonathan Wade coming up to make the stop near the line of scrimmage. The Vols linebackers have made some big plays this year and it is the only group that has not lost a star player to injury. They have really been hurt in that department. Justin Harrell and Inky Johnson, a defensive tackle and a corner. Guys that they were counting on went down early. 
Tereshinsky goes to the shotgun at second and 11. Tennessee shows blitz and comes with it. Instead, it's a handoff to Lumpkin, and Lumpkin barrels his way. And a big run for Lumpkin. This kid has really been running well for Georgia the last three weeks. Boy, he has. He got his first start a week ago. 13 carries, a career high, 101 yards. Here's the senior changing the play. This is what they said right. is his best attribute. Pump fake. Tereshinsky deep down the sideline. And it's dropped. Could have been intercepted right in the hands of Demetrius Morley. He couldn't hold on. Well, they tried to get him to bite on the pump fake. Jonathan Wade was the corner. He really doesn't get fooled on the play. And then the safety, Morley is able to come over and help over the top. That's good work by the safety, helping the corner on the pump and fake and go. Wade may have gotten away with one, cutting off the route. Second and ten. Lumpkin again tries to reverse his field, and he'll lose five yards. He was drilled by the penetration of Antonio Reynolds. Well, Georgia really needs to get off to a good start tonight. The last two weeks, no points in the first half. I mean, they've, they've got to have a spark, just even a field goal, something early in the ball game would do wonders for Mark Rick and this offensive football team. But you have to feel that Andy Bailey would like a little closer yeah, shot absolutely. than what he'd be facing now as he fills in for the injured Katu. A.J. Bryant is in as the third wide receiver. Tennessee showing blitz. Joe T. changing at the line of scrimmage. John Chavis loves to blitz in this kind of situation. Backs off, comes with only four. Tereshinsky still under pressure, and the catch is made by Massacre. I don't know there is a chance he's going to get unloaded on going up for that ball. He did it anyway. Tereshinsky doesn't have the big arm, but you can see how accurate he is. And he got him in the right play. Lumpkin again. They have blocked well against the Tennessee front so far. So much of what Joe T can do is, is not only get him in the right play, he's a fifth-year senior who's been with Mark Rick the whole time. Got hurt early in the second game of this season after he had won the starting job. Waited his entire career to be the starter as a third-generation Georgia Bulldog. Lumpkin powers his way inside the five. They need to reach the two-and-a-half for a first down, and Lumpkin really getting some good work here on the opening drive. Here's Mark Rick to his average 11 wins a year through the last five years. He's just been remarkable. He has, and he's got this program at a point now where, you know, it seems kind of cliches where you say they don't rebuild, they reload, but that's where Georgia is right now. The expectation level extremely high. The recruiting base is very solid, and this is a team that will contend year in and year out for the SEC East. Lumpkin, five carries. 22 yards so far. They got that left side again, I think, if they want to run it that way. Tereshinsky tries the quarterback draw, then just throws it away. <laughs> now, I don't think Tereshinsky was out of the tackle box, and certainly there wasn't anybody well, over there as a receiver. I think there was somebody somewhat in the area, but he threw it well over Sitting his head. Sitting in the stands? It, it, no, he was out there. It was an uncatchable <laughs> pass, but watch, Massaqua is over there somewhat. Oh, yeah. Okay, now he's... he's sure, he's close. Kind of over there. <laughs> You're closer to it than Massaqua. <laughs> Here's Andy Bailey. Hasn't kicked since 2004. He is in there because Brandon Katu, the All-SEC kicker, is out. His first try in two years. And it's good. A very happy Andy Bailey comes through for the injured Katu. Aga and company up 3-0. Back at sold out Sanford Stadium, almost 93,000 people have seen Georgia take the lead. 3-0 over Tennessee. People are asking, is Georgia for real? They're ranked 10th. An easy win against Western Kentucky. 
They had to fight against South Carolina, then their second consecutive shutout. Then they survived two games against Colorado and Mississippi. But those are games where you say, look, they've had big games before. They had big games coming up. Those are sandwich games. Maybe they didn't pay attention the way they should have. Maybe. Big kick return for LaMarcus Coker. 40 yards. Well, that is an area where Tennessee has not been very good, not just this year, but in the last few years. Kickoff. Coker, who got his first start as tailback last week against Memphis, has great speed. And he has shown an ability to make big plays. Running it, he caught a big touchdown pass in the loss to Florida. And that's a big kickoff return to get his offense excellent starting field position. Coker stays in at tailback behind Ainge. Georgia shows nothing but that front four. They'll try to stop everything with those four guys up front without having to go to a fifth man and a rush or an eighth man in the box against the run. Yeah, Georgia's going to show a lot of two safety look to help out on those outside receivers, Meacham and Swain. That means it's up to those seven guys, the defensive line and the three linebackers, to stop the Tennessee run. And that's what Willie Martinez, the defensive coordinator, is going to start out by doing, keeping two safeties back for the pass defense and letting the front seven stop the run, if they can. Ainge on second and six. Good protection, throws high. Intended for Smith out in the flat and way over him. Let's check in first time tonight, Reese Davis. Reese? Mike, the SEC is 27-10. Tell you what, Reese, there's going to be some happy hogs all week. They earned that one. Over the middle, Smith bobbled the ball, and he's going to be just shy of a first down, hit by Jarvis Jackson, the Boy, middle he linebacker. Got a, he got a good spot. I, I think a very oh. favorable spot, because when he bobbled it, I thought he, he lost the first You're down. Right. I thought he had it, and then when he bobbled it, he didn't have it. That's a bad spot. When he first touched the ball, he was at the first down marker, but after he bobbled it and was hit by Jarvis Jackson, I don't didn't think he had it anymore. I think he was almost a yard short after he regained possession. But a very good spot for Tennessee and a first down. Well, now it's one to one on third down. First third down situation, the Georgia defense won that time. Thanks to a nice spot, the Tennessee offense won. You know, Holly talked about the injuries and the kicker with the kicker for Georgia. The injury problem for Tennessee is up front. Left tackle Aaron Sears and right guard Anthony Parker both starting tonight, but neither one practiced very much. Sears a sprained ankle and elbow on the left side. Parker a sprained right ankle. Be interesting how long they can go tonight. Here's a flanker screen and Smith dropped it. You saw the winning percentage on Philip Fulmer, 77.6%. Um, that's number one among coaches who have been head coaches for more than 10 years. It is a yeah. remarkable winning percentage for Philip Fulmer. But like other high-profile guys, he's under a lot of pressure because everybody says you ought to be 11-0, 12-0 every year. Well, you know, the expectation level at Georgia's high. It's just as high at Tennessee. Yes, and it five is. five and six, I mean, he's the first to admit that's uh, – that's not acceptable at Tennessee, and they did a great job this offseason regrouping for this year. Play fake up the middle goes Coker. Nice job by Ainge to carry it out, and Keelan Johnson had to come up from the free safety spot to make the tackle after a 19-yard game. Well, it's a pass look out of the shotgun. Georgia thinking pass. Excellent job of blocking on the inside. Aaron Sears, who we just mentioned with the left ankle, a great block coming across the formation, blocking the middle linebacker and opening things up for Coker. And this guy has really come on 125 yards last week against Memphis and 148 the week before against Marshall. Arian Foster is in for the first time. He's number 27 in Tennessee's backfield. He'll get a carry. And there's the middle linebacker, Jarvis Jackson, who missed a tackle on the last play, but made that one. 
We talked about David Cutcliffe, the impact he's had, not just on Eric Gaines, but the wide receivers, the entire offense, and how they practice, how they prepare. Look at the difference last year to this year so far. Tremendous improvement in the passing game, and look at the big plays down here. 40-yard-plus plays, only one all of last year. Already 13 of those kind of plays. Very close friend of Philip Fulmer. They've been friends many, many years and delighted to be back together. Here comes the blitz. Johnson up the middle. They'll go out in the flat, get a short completion to the tight end, Chris Brown. You know, it's hard for me to believe that David Cutcliffe went to Mississippi as the head coach, had the kind of success that he did at Ole Miss, a place that's not easy to have that kind of success, and be fired after one bad year, a firing that Archie Manning, who was obviously uh, a big deal down in Mississippi, said was embarrassing. Well, it was. I mean, I, I didn't think it was warranted. I thought David was an excellent head coach, but he is happy as heck to be back at Tennessee right now with his best friend and coaching quarterbacks, which he loves to do. And boy, has he coached some good ones. Main short set as they flooded the outside, and Smith will make the catch. He gets down to the 15-yard line. That is tough for a college secondary defense. Well, again, you're seeing two safeties for Georgia. They're trying to keep everything in front. They don't want to give up one of those 40-yard plays or, or longer. So they're playing a lot of soft zones. So you got here and you got here, but here is the void right in here. The middle receiver in that little three-four mace, three-receiver formation finds the opening, and Eric Ainge finds him. Zone coverage, find the hole and sit down, show the quarterback a good target. Ains for the end zone, Smith, touchdown! Brett Smith with his second touchdown catch of the year, and Ainge made that drive look easy. Yes, he did. showed great patience because when Georgia was trying to force everything underneath, he took what was underneath. You take what the defense gives you, then when they give you an opportunity to make a big play, he made the big play. The middle linebacker Jackson is trying to get back. The rover back, Trey Battle, had the coverage. Neither one was close. And the point after by Colquitt is good. Or Will Hoyt, excuse me. And Tennessee has struck back at Georgia after the Dogs get a field goal. The Vols get their first touchdown of the night, and they lead it 7-3. ESPN's College Football Primetime, brought to you by Hummer, like nothing else. American Chemistry, essential to living. Learn more at AmericanChemistry.com. Aerial coverage for tonight's game, courtesy of the Outback Steakhouse Airship, Bloomin' Onion. The Outback Steakhouse Airship specializes in college football and PGA golf coverage. Look for the Bloomin' Onion at sporting events throughout the year. Number 25. Ainge on the phone upstairs to talk about that last drive where he was pretty darn good. Yep. He went 60 yards and nine plays for the touchdown, and Smith caught three balls on that drive. Very impressed with Eric Ainge's patience on that drive, taking the underneath throws, and then when the opportunity came to throw it down the field, he stuck it in there. And Smith could get a lot of action because of those other two wide receivers, the guys who uh, put up such big numbers. Let's go back and look at the touch. I'll show you what Eric Ainge saw. Over here is Robert Meacham, and this is Jason Swain. So because of that, you've got two guys watching Meacham and two guys watching Swain. That's going to leave Brett Smith right here working against the linebacker Jarvis Jackson in the middle of the field. They're paying so much attention to those outside two that the guy in the middle is finding the openings. Brett Smith scored, and as we said, three catches on that drive, all of them in big situations. And Jarvis Jackson, no matter how quick he is, cannot be expected right. to cover a wide receiver. Tereshinsky out of the gun to Lumpkin in the flat. Gets a block out there, and Lumpkin will pick up a couple. Let's check with Reese. Tigers. They've shown me. You know, Missouri's the show me state, and that was the this was the game they had a chance to show the nation if they're for real. They're showing it right now. Boy, they sure are. 
Those opportunities don't come along very often. You got to make the most. Lumpkin again. Outstanding defense. Carl, the strong side linebacker, was out there to make a sure tackle. Let's check in with Holly. Well, guys, Joe Tereshinsky injured his ankle, which are big elastics that help you strengthen particular muscle groups. But, guys, it is still a little painful. We've seen him hobbling a little bit, but he's playing through it. Holly Rowe doing her best. Dr. Jerry Punch imitation. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Tereshinsky with good time. Down the middle. And caught. Yes, a caught. And he hung on. Morley nearly killed him after the catch, but a 33-yard. As another flag goes down, well, is this a challenge? Sideline warning on the Tennessee bench. That's their first sideline warning. This is something they've tried to emphasize in the last couple of years, to keep all the coaches and the other players back from the sideline so there aren't collisions over there. Well, this is a big-time game. I mean, emotions are oh. running high in this game. With Florida winning today, both these teams need to win to keep pace with the Florida Gators. And Tennessee has already lost to Florida. They can ill afford to lose another one right now. That's the fullback, Sutherland, getting a rare carry. And Morley comes up from the secondary to make the tackle. And here's what Todd was talking about. The Gators now 4-0 in the conference after their win today. Georgia is even with them in the loss column and undefeated as well. And there's Tennessee 0-1. You fall to 0-2 yeah. with those other with those other teams, you're in a lot of trouble. And that's our ESPNU All-State standings review. Tereshinsky to the gun on second and 11. Instead gives it to Lumpkin. Here's the reverse. Bryant. Boy, Tennessee played that beautifully. Stayed at home. Jonathan Hefty, the free safety, didn't buy into the fake. Stayed where he was supposed to be and made a solid tackle. Two plays in a row, we've seen the two Tennessee safeties make big plays. Morley blitzed and got the first play. Now Hefty's going to read the reverse, break down, and make a nice open field tackle. That's not easy to do, to tackle a fast wide receiver in the open field like that the way Hefney did. Back-to-back -back plays for the Tennessee defense. Their two safeties have come up with big plays. Third and 13. It's John Chavis, the defensive coordinator for Tennessee. Been with Phillip a long time. He's lost a couple key guys, but this group is still playing very well. D'Amico Goodman, number 85, is in as an additional wide receiver. Bryant on a pass that's under Caught it right in front of Jonathan Wade. That ball was three steps under throw, yeah. but still caught for 46. Well, they tried to go with a pump fake to the left and then come back to throw to the right, and it was a little out of Joe T's arm strength range. The ball was under throw, but A.J. Bryant with a terrific adjustment to the ball in the air. Unbelievable adjustment to the ball. Joe T keeps it outside. And Bryant, and, and again, how many times do we see in a situation like that, the yep. wide receiver has a better ability to adjust and a throw, get the ball than a defensive back does? Wade never able to get his feet under him so he could jump. Locked it all the way inside the wall. Defense has played since that South Carolina game that we did early in September. Will they get the playoff before the clock runs out on the quarter? They do. Seven. And they just cleaned house at the goal line. The reason Georgia wanted to go and get it at the before the end of the quarter, they had an unbalanced lineup, and that's why they went on the quick count to make sure they got that play called before Tennessee could adjust their defense. Bailey for the point after. He's made a field goal and an extra point in relief of the all-conference place kicker. Georgia back on top. Syracuse new uniforms. They have burned out two picture tubes in my new set. 47-7. <laughs> that's the 
average TD drive for Georgia. They had to march 80 on the last one, and they look good doing it. Ben Wilson to kick off. In a seesaw game right from the beginning. Lucas Taylor. Ended as he got to the 22. Let's go back to the touchdown. The reason Georgia wanted to run this play before the end, he wasn't able to adjust. And boy, was that a gaping hole. Ainge, good play fake. Brown, the tight end, will get only a couple. And that swarming Georgia defense, led by Jarvis Jackson, holds it to a two yard gain. Oh, Eric Ainge has been here before. Five of eight so far. Pretty good start. I was here and did the game two years ago when he came in here as a freshman and led his team to an upset, 19 to 14, over Georgia when they were ranked number three in the country. So he was outstanding as a yeah. freshman. He's played well in this stadium, in this environment. The problems he had last year when he alternated a quarterback with Clawson. He talking about that game in October of 2004, Todd. It was the first road start for Eric Gage in the SEC. He threw for two touchdowns that day. Tennessee went on to win it 19 to 14. And he served notice he was going to be another in a long line of big time quarterbacks in Tennessee. Sort of got sidetracked last year, but he looks so different this he season. He sure does. And that's David Cutcliffe. And that's Eric Ainge knowing that the job is his, and he doesn't have to look over his shoulder in any situation. Arian Foster gets a crack at tailback, picks up maybe one. <laughs> if you just joined us, it's been a great game so far. Number 13 against number 10. Georgia started it with a field goal. Tennessee immediately answered, got their touchdown. Georgia came right back. Got their touchdown, and they're up by three with 13.07 on a turning second quarter clock in front of almost 93,000 people here in Athens. Ainge dumps it off, dropped by Cotton to tight end. Let's go to Reese. Let's enter after the game with wall-to-wall -wall baseball coverage, and ESPN News delivers it now. Thank you, Reese. He's about as loud in this stadium right now as I can ever remember hearing a place. Ains, plenty of time, almost intercepted. <laughs> almost intercepted twice yep. in the hands of Tony Taylor, and then Paul Oliver had a shot at him. That was oh, excellent boy. coverage. We saw one touchdown when a linebacker covering an underneath receiver. This time, Tony Taylor turned, got his eyes on the football, and almost came away with the interception. That ball was intended for Meacham, and Tony Taylor was right there. Three Georgia Bulldogs had their hands on the football. I'll tell you what, the secondary has acquitted itself pretty well so far. Cole quit to punt. Mikey Henderson, who has one touchdown return this year and another one that he squandered look out look Mikey out. likes it how about the block on the punter 85 yards <laughs> that time he didn't lose possession of the ball before he crossed the goal Mikey Henderson. Holy cow. Last year in this ballgame in Knoxville, the score was 13 to 7 in the fourth quarter. Thomas Flowers returned a punt 57 yards for a touchdown to give Georgia a 20 to 7 lead, and it was lights out after that. Wow, that's a miss. Point Not after down, is though. shanked left. Let's see what the marker is. Wow, that was ugly. Very often that's offside. Offsides, number 20 on the defense. Corner will be half the distance to the goal. Replay the try. 
problem is, you know, I don't know about you, but when I have shanks in golf, I can't get rid of them on the next swing. <laughs> no, you got to go in the woods and find them. There's Kato, who suffered uh, a severely torn hamstring. Bailey, who has already hit an extra point in the field goal, gets a second life on this because of the offside call. Goodness. Lined that one through, barely made it, but it did. Well, we've seen some shaky kicking this weekend all over the country, but that wasn't a shaky return. It's scoring, it's big plays. Last year a punt return, this year a punt return. Taylor and Coker are deep for Tennessee. Coker didn't make the 20. Let's go back to the punt return. I want to show you something. This is remarkable. Marcus Brown buried it. Colquitt ended up with Brown in a headlock. And now Tennessee wants to get back to the ground. That ball okay. came loose. I oh, think they're going to say that was oh, down. They are. It looks like they are marking him down. It looked like the knee was clearly down, even though it's recovered by battle. But Tennessee has got to hold on here. They, they've got to weather this emotional storm and play football. Hardesty. Wow. From that angle, a little hard to see. And Tony Taylor hit him. Now the problem is, because this was ruled down and not a fumble, it is not a reviewable play. So he was called down, and even if it looks like a fumble, they can't review that play. Looked like a good call, though. Smith, again, very busy tonight. Well, that was a weird play right there. Yes, it was. Well, Georgia only had 10 guys on the field. Asher Allen, number two, came running on late, and they threw right to the spot where Asher Allen was supposed to be. They didn't have enough defenders on the field. Eric Gaines saw it and just audible to a quick throw to the slot receiver. But it looked like seven of them were over there on the flanker screen. Now, a little confusion on the Georgia defensive sideline that time. Again, Eric Gaines, just keep your poise. And do what you've been doing. Take what this Georgia defense gives you. They don't like to give up big plays. You must be patient and execute. There's enough to get the first down. Here comes the blitz. Ainge. Smart. He's a chemistry major. <laughs> Draw play. Coker. Flag is down. So is Coker at the 24. Asher Allen took a chance there. Tried to cut him. 24% conversion. And they've done a good job on Tennessee tonight in third and long. Probably a soft zone. Make Eric Ainge throw it underneath. And make a sure tackle in the open field. The crowd is going nuts. Georgia comes with three. Coker out in the flat. And look at the red jersey swarm. Yeah, that's just a well-disciplined defense. Take away anything down the field. Make the quarterback throw underneath and then go make a sure tackle and get a lot of red hats and shirts to the football. For more on that dog defense, here's Holly. Big time. They're really jacked up, aren't they? Well, I'll tell you, the, the, the offense came out and moved the football. The defense has played. Smokey. Smokey can't stay. He can't bear to watch another punt return. That's why he's laying down and turned away. Here's Mikey, not this time, taking it down at the 18-yard line. A solid special teams play by Demetrius Morley. Let's get down to Holly. It means so much to him. He knows the great tradition that goes with, along with playing it with the Buttle Dogs. Thomas Brown, big run. Them one-dimensional. Yep, you're right. Georgia in passing is only 90th in the country. So Tennessee needs to stop the run, and right now they can't do it. Brown again, dragging tacklers with him to the 49. Even as a quarterback starter contender, he was on the punt protection teams. He just wanted to do anything he could. Brown, again! Nice cutback. With Joe Tereshinsky coming out and throwing the ball well early in this ballgame. Brown, a junior out of Tucker, Georgia. Back in the eye. Brown again. Good stiff arm. Plows inside the 40. Let's go to Reese. By the Gators against LSU. 
You score on that defense, yep. you've done something. And they're doing it the right way, taking one game at a time. Everybody talked about how tough that four-game stretch is. Two down, two to go. Yep. Tereshinsky, all day the throw, deep down the sideline. Caught a good throw. Catch. Todd, guys are making plays they for They are, him. absolutely are. Brown, nowhere to go this time. You know, and, and this happens a lot in football, whether it's college football, pro football, but if you malign a group of, of players enough or too much, they get that mentality like a cornered animal, like a cornered dog. And I think that's the way this offensive group felt. I think they know they have playmakers. They know they have guys that can get it done. They haven't been clicking. You know, four of the five games, they were held under 300 yards. And I think they just saw this game as an opportunity to say, you know what, let's shut some people up. I mean, let's come out and play at the same kind of level of intensity as our defense has played all year. Working tonight, Sutherland and Brown are the men in the eye. Brown behind the fullback. Seeing a lot of two tight end look and a lot of power looks for Georgia. And this is lining up and saying, here we come, boys. Stop us if you can. And right now they can't. Daniel Inman, when we did the South Carolina game, he was not out there. He was suspended. He's back and playing. Missed two starts. Michael Turner's been out a little bit of backup tackle. He's back in the rotation. This offensive line looks pretty good right now for Georgia. Another two tight end set. Third and six. Tereshinsky wants to throw out in the flat. Sutherland down. Touchdown. This guy, all he does is make touchdowns. Yes, sir. <laughs> and all Tereshinsky does is complete passes. Todd, this is just in your face. Yep. Here we come. You can't stop us football. It's power running. It's play action. And it's a senior quarterback who's playing lights out. Bailey. Let's see if they can execute an extra point a little bit better than last time. And they do. Georgia stunning Tennessee. They're up 24 to 7. ESPN Full Circle, Florida versus Auburn, next Saturday at 745. It's the 1980 National Championship team. It's Jordan Herschel's freshman team, right? They beat Notre Dame. Herschel. Sugar Bowl. Taylor and Coker are deep. And that's kicked out of bounds. That is a major mistake on special yep. teams to kick the ball out of bounds. They give good field position to Tennessee, but Joe Tereshinsky has played one for 33 yards. And uh, I just think that those two plays, passes by Tereshinsky and catches by Massacraw, ignited this Georgia offense. Now can Tennessee respond in front of almost 93,000 hostile fans? Meacham flanker screen. Check in with Reese. All right, Mike, the game's a quarter. Whew. Reese, that's, that's unbelievable. Ainge pump fake being chased. Got rid of it to Coker. Boy, nice play by Eric Ainge. It looked sure like was. Quentin Moses was going to get him for the sack. He was able to kind of shrug that off. And keep his composure and his eyes downfield. And it helps when you're six foot six to be able to see what's happening downfield, even though there's bodies flying around you. Watch Quentin Moses, 94, is going to come around the top and, and grab a hold of Ainge, just not able to, to bring him down. And Ainge alertly gets the ball to Coker. I think Willie Martinez wanted a timeout. Feels that maybe his defense losing a little steam here. Slow this Tennessee offense down. 
So if the clock stops with 3.44 to go first half, Tennessee's ball when we come back. Now here is tonight's Aflac trivia question. Which mascot lineage had the earlier start? Smokey at Tennessee or Ugga at Georgia? We'll give you the Lance answer later. No, I said later. It's a big boulder. Uh -huh. It's a very important drive for Tennessee. If they can score here before halftime, they're right back in this football game. Georgia may have been offside. Ainge with a three play. Coker. Blockers in front. Nice cut back inside the 30. Now we'll check the marker. Yeah. Nice job by Tennessee staying with the play because LaMarcus Coker turned that into a good game. Better than a five yard penalty. Willie Martinez was concerned about Coker. He really felt he gave them another weapon on this Offside, offense. Number 99 on the defense. The penalty will be declined. First and 10. Charles Johnson was offside. It's been a great game from the beginning. A lot of huge plays. Georgia has had the majority of them, however. They're up 24 to 7. Tennessee driving. They have reached the Georgia 29 yard line. Under three and a half minutes to go in the half. Ains draw play. Coker. Oh, great nice. cut by Coker. Holy cow. You know, we kind of laughed amongst the three of us with Holly. You know, LaMarcus Coker, we talked to him on the phone. He said, you know, I, I've been waiting. I've tried to be patient. I've just been waiting for my chance to play and to be the starter. He's a true freshman. So he only had to wait a couple games, really, in his career. But he has made the most of it. And an 89-yard run against Marshall, went over 100 yards in that game, and then started last week and ran for 125. So off to a pretty good start tonight against this Georgia defense. He makes you play the run legitimately. That helps the passing game. Ainge, play action, floats it toward the end zone and too far. Intended for Meacham, but he was covered pretty well by battle and with the uh, arc of that pass, nobody was going to catch. Well, Charles Johnson forced the bad throw. Charles Johnson, there was a lot of play faking. They faked the reverse, and Charles Johnson, number 99, who jumped off sides, got right in the quarterback's face and forced a bad throw. Meacham was a little bit open, but Ainge, there's no way with the pressure from Charles Johnson, he could make a good throw. Pretty slow developing play. Coker. And one thing about that last play, defensive ends who rush the passer, you make all the fakes they want. They're coming after yeah. you anyway. Yeah, if you tell them your job is to go get the quarterback, then that's what they're going to do, especially when you come on an inside stunt like that. He had no outside responsibility whatsoever. And Philip Fulmer opting to go for it here on fourth and one, knowing that his team desperately needs a touchdown. He knows he's got Will Hoyt, a, a, an experienced kicker. You but like this? I do like it. I think they've run the ball well enough in this game so far to take a shot here. I think it's a smart call. And a quarterback keeper, that should be good enough for the first down. Now, I think if you go for a field goal right there, Georgia wins. You know, it wins the half. And they go in with more momentum because they feel like they stopped this good-looking drive of Tennessee's. You go for it and make it. You got a chance to score a touchdown. Even if they still have to settle for a field goal now, at least they've, they've made that push. I agree with you. And I think if you go for the field goal at this point, you say to your offense, I don't have a lot of faith no. in you. And that's not a good message going to the halftime either. It wasn't a great mark. And they will measure. But it is a first down. I think Tennessee, I mean, they are running the ball with some effectiveness. They've got all three of their timeouts, so they don't have to worry about the clock with a minute 57 left. I think the middle of the field is open for them in the passing game because, again, a lot of two-safety look to take away Swain and Meacham. I think a slot receiver in the middle has got a chance. Got Taylor and Smith over here, both in the slot. Want to screen to Coker. Boy, and Georgia defense did beautifully down to the 15-yard line. Ray Gant with the tackle on the screen. 
Let's go back to the studio and Reese. Mike Cummins is headed to the American League Championship Series. Mark and Lou will be with me. See you in a bit. All right, Reese, Coker straight up the middle. They need to reach the nine for a first down. Now, if you're going to go for it, it's a little longer. They'll use the timeout and be able to talk about it. But fourth and maybe three, that's long. Yeah. We'll find out Philip Fulmer's decision when we come back to Georgia. Our Affleck trivia question, which mascot lineage had the earlier debut, Smokey for Tennessee or Ugga for Georgia? The answer, it was Smokey in 1953. Ugga didn't come along until 56. Georgia's first mascot was a goat in 1892. He probably named it Ugly. Just shortened <laughs> it up for the dog. I'd have to say that Ugga has maybe passed Smokey in terms of visibility nationally. I think so, too. I don't too. know that there's any mascot in, in this country that has more notoriety than Ugga. Foster is in a tailback on third down and three. Ainge out in the flat has a first down to Smith, and Smith tries to stay in bounds. Got down to the one. The reason that Brett Smith is having so much success tonight is because of the attention being paid to Meacham and Swain. He's in the slot working against Asher Allen. Allen is not one of the starting defensive backs. He's a freshman backup who's in there in a nickel situation. Smart job by Eric Ainge. Find the right matchup. Brett Smith against a more inexperienced defensive back. And Smith is the receiver with the hot hand tonight. Had five catches last week against Memphis, five again tonight. Foster is in behind the fullback, Corey Anderson. And Tennessee is going to use another timeout. Nice job by the officials there to be able to mark that ball at the one. You really got to pay attention when a guy is that close to the sideline. Steve McDare, Ray Lewis in the room. You know, I, I mean, I don't follow pro football nearly as much as I follow college football, but the way it sounded to me last year, I, I thought Steve McNair was ready to ride off into the sunset. Well, he's I been hurt he was done. so much. Uh, defensive player out there. Eric Ainge has been a, a leader in this drive. Five of six for 51 yards. That last one huge to get him down into the goal line situation. Foster, no oh. signal now, there is touchdown, Tennessee. Boy, he stuck that ball out. He was stopped on his initial movement and alertly stuck that ball out. Sometimes that can be dangerous, but all the ball has to do is cross the plane. Watch Foster. He's not going to be in at first. He's hit right in the hole and sticks the ball across the plane for the touchdown right there. Nice work by Arian Foster. He is met right in the hole by Jarvis Jackson, but he doesn't give up on the play and is able to get the football across. His first touchdown of the year. Will Hoyt for the point after. It's a huge drive for Absolutely. Tennessee. They were down 24 to 7, and they've cut it to 10 with under a minute to go in the first half. 65-yard drive that took four minutes, lasted 11 plays. Here's today's Good Hands flashback presented by Allstate. Take you back to 1996. And after being stood up at the line of scrimmage on a sneak, Peyton Manning sprints away from pressure to find Marcus Nash. That's a five-yard touchdown pass. Tennessee beat Georgia in Athens 29 to 17. That was not the best thing that Peyton Manning did, which is run. But boy, what a great quarterback. Honed all of his skills at Tennessee. And one of the reasons that Eli Manning went to Mississippi was because of the coordinator who left here went to Mississippi as the head coach. So he's gotten to coach Peyton Manning right. and Eli Manning. Not That's bad. Right. And he's done a great job with both. Yes, That's has. why Peyton Manning told Eric Ainge this summer, hey, with Coach Cut, just shut up and listen to him. Trust him. Even though you've not been with him, even though he didn't recruit recruit you, trust him. He will make you a better quarterback, and he's done that for yeah. Eric Ainge. And he said, that was good enough for me. If, yep. he if David Cutcliffe tells me to go out there and play without a helmet, I'm going to do it. The 
that one go out of the end zone and Georgia will have the ball at the 20. Georgia has certainly been impressive on both sides of the ball. Look at these drives. 80 yards on the first one, an 86-yard punt return, and then 81 yards every single yard on the ground. And remember, coming into the game, they were averaging 47 yards on a scoring drive. They had 22 drives the last two weeks with only four scores. So much different offense tonight for Georgia. Clock is running, and so is Thomas Brown. Georgia seemingly content to let the uh, clock run down here, unless Brown happens to break a big one. And now they'll be very cautious in their own end. Now Tereshinsky says, let's go get a drink of water. It's been a good half. 24-14, Georgia pleasing this huge home crowd. They have played exceptional football in the first half. Let's go to Holly Rowe. Coach, you decide to go for it there. How did that drive and score change the demeanor of this game? Well, I mean, we're just still two scores down. It's just still a football game. We gotta, we gotta quit giving them big plays. That's the biggest thing. I don't know if they can stop us. We can't stop them either right now. All right, thanks, Coach. 24-14 at the half. Now let's join Reese Davis for the Pontiac Performance Halftime Report. All right, Mike, you never know in the SEC. The dogs come out fighting 10-point lead at halftime. You also don't know what's going to happen in baseball. Yankees, big payroll. In Athens, Georgia, almost 93,000 people have watched this first half, and they have seen Georgia rack up 210 yards in total offense, only 87 yards of their entire game average, which was a woeful 89th in the country. But, boy, they have looked good tonight, Todd. Well, I think they're winning the game because they've done three things better than Tennessee so far. Both quarterbacks have played very well, but they've run the ball better than Tennessee. They've been better on third down, and they've been better in the special teams. The big return by Mikey Henderson really kind of turned the momentum of this game early. Tennessee with a big score right at the end of the half to get right back in it, but they've got to run the football better, and they've got to be better on third down. And remember what Philip Fulmer said at the end of the half. I don't know if we can stop each other right now. Well, Tennessee better be able to stop Georgia because Georgia has done the job on them in the first half with 24 points, and Georgia has not been penalized in the first two quarters. That's huge as well. And the Bulldogs will get the ball to start the third period. Wow, great coverage. Brown cut deep in his own territory. Well, Joe Tereshinsky making his first start since the South Carolina managed the game extremely well. Some good checks in the running game, and he has been everything that Mark Rick wanted him to be in this game in the first half. It's a danger zone right here for Georgia. They start at their own six-yard line. Lumpkin, who has run very, very well tonight across the 10 to the 11-yard line. So Georgia knows they've got an edge up front. I mean, you know, Tennessee, you can't emphasize enough how big of a loss Justin Harrell was, their best defensive lineman who had the torn bicep injury in the Air Force game, went ahead and played against Florida, but really was not 100%, had surgery after that. He was their best interior lineman. They are not as big, they're not as physical inside as they were when they started the season. And Georgia, a lot of two tight end, leading with their fullback, power running by Craig Lumpkin. They've been able to do that in the first half, and here they are again with a second and short. Well, you can't replace guys like Harrell. Tereshinsky, that one is tapped and intercepted by Stork. Huge play. <laughs> 
Well, you can't fault Tereshinsky on this one because Tennessee was loading up the box. They were bringing extra guys in to stop the run. But if you throw short, you've got to cut guys' arms down. And the block was too late trying to stop the linebacker. And a big interception for Tennessee. When you throw short like that, you must get guys' hands down. The ball was deflected. That's not the quarterback's fault. That is Stewart's second interception. He was the safety who moved to corner after Inky Johnson was hurt. So he's done a tremendous job over there. Now they go to Coker, and Coker down to the 14-yard line. This would be huge for Tennessee if they could get a touchdown off of this turnover. Well, we talked about Joe T. Here's Eric Ainge's numbers in the first half. Very, very impressive. I like his poise. I like his patience and taking what the Georgia defense gives him. That's a very highly rated Georgia defense. Pass defense and scoring defense. Ains may be changing the play. Straight back to throw. Quickly underneath to Meacham. Meacham has a first down. Drives inside the 10 to the 7 yard line before he's forced out of bounds by Oliver. One of the few times Meacham has been involved in the offense, he draws so much attention. Of course, if you're averaging 115 yards a game, you're going to get some. Well, Brett Smith had five catches in the game last week, five in the first half tonight. Jason Swain has been shut out tonight, but again, so much attention's paid to Swain and Meacham, that has opened things up for Brett Smith tonight. Coming into this game, they had almost 1,000 yards receiving and 10 touchdowns. Ainge floats it to the end zone, incomplete, nearly intercepted. If Oliver isn't backing up and has his feet under him, he has an easy pick. Well, and also, if he goes up with two hands, maybe he has a chance to come down with it, but he just went up with one, kind of spiked it in volleyball, and I think he's saying to himself, why don't I just try to pick it? But it's still a good play because the receiver was behind him. If he doesn't get his hand on the ball, it's a touchdown. Swain comes back and sets up on the wing. Oliver. Or rather, Coker on the draw, and Coker just inside the five-yard line. This possession right here is all about momentum. Yep. A touchdown, you've really got it on your side. A field goal, probably not. Four wide receivers, three bunts to this side for Ainge. Third and goal. Moving up front, they'll whistle the play. Giving yourself a little bit more space and a little bit more depth in the end zone to throw the football. Coker is out here as a flanker. Five wide receiver set up. Blitz coming. Ainge over the middle, incomplete. There's some contact there, and it's going to be an interference call or a holding on battle. Well, they spread the Georgia defense out all across the field, and they found the matchup they wanted, which was Meacham working on battle. Pass interference, number 25 on the defense. The penalty will be enforced at the two-yard line, first and goal. By formation, they have Meacham right here, and he's working on Battle, who's a safety. That's a matchup that favors Tennessee, a safety against a corner, and, or against a, a wide receiver, and interference by Battle. Battle's a very good free safety, but not as adept at lining up on the top receiver and playing man-to-man -man coverage down by the goal line. So now first and goal from the two after the penalty. Coker is the deep man, Anderson the fullback. Ainge floats it, incomplete, oh, flags everywhere. There's a flag right before the snap, and then one in the end zone. Two on the far side of the field, one on the short side. Brown is indicating the flags are against Georgia. Two fouls, hold 
holding. Number 12 on the defense. That penalty will be enforced. Half the distance to the goal. It will be a first down. That's Brandon Miller, one of the linebackers. So they'll mark it at the one. It's still first and goal. Yeah. So we've had two penalties worth a yard. Georgia was expecting run all the way on that first and goal play. And Tennessee fooled them with the play action and got the penalty. Now first down right on the one yard line. Quarterback keeper by Ainge and the big quarterback's in there for the touchdown. The shift in momentum goes to Tennessee off the interception. Well, the sudden change situation for the Georgia defense. They had to come right back on the field. Tennessee took advantage of the field position. Got a little help with the penalty, and Eric Gange gets the ball across the goal line. You were a big quarterback. Did you like the sneak call when it came in? I did. You know, the other thing, I mean, we never ran an option except on goal line and short yardage when I was at Penn State. And, and we were very effective because you know, it's just something you don't do all the time. But if you're six foot six, 230 pounds like Ainge, you know, as long as you protect the football, it's a pretty safe play. Plays being reviewed. <laughs> question is, did the ball cross the plane? The official who made the call was looking in from that direction. He's looking in at the ball, at the quarterback, and as Ainge fell off this pile, that's when the signal was made for touchdown. Again, it has to be indisputable video evidence to overturn the call in the field, which was ruled a touchdown. Now, good luck in that pile up. Mm -hmm. New ball game. It was a new ball game right before half yes, when they sir. cut it to 10. Now it's really a new ball game. Eric Ainge said when he wanted to talk quarterbacking with David Cutcliffe, Cutcliffe for the longest time wouldn't talk to him about offense. He wanted to talk to him about defense. He wanted to give him the history of why people do things, and he understands review, it so much better. The call on the field stands. Touchdown, Tennessee. I don't think there was any way they were going to overturn that, but Ainge has learned so much under Cutcliffe as past Tennessee quarterbacks have. Well, that, that's a huge thing. I mean, the, the difference between knowing what your job is and what the play is called and why you call it, why you want to run it against this defense is huge for a quarterback, and that's, that's the transformation that Ainge has gone under. Will Hoyt knocks the extra point through. Tennessee has scored two touchdowns in the last 4 3 and they're back within a field goal here in Athens, Georgia. you the prime time pulse games on the family of networks not much of a game in berkeley cal is pummeling oregon 28 to 10 on abc we got a ball game in lexington south carolina and kentucky still a lot of time to go on espn2 cat just missed a long field goal gamecocks continuing to hold that seven point lead all right, Reese, here we have 11 minutes and 47 seconds to go. Third quarter of play at Sanford Stadium in Athens. And Ainge, after the turnover, gets the touchdown. And we have a three-point ball game. Thomas Brown runs up on the kickoff to the eight. That's twice they've pinned him on the sidelines. Thomas Brown has averaged over 26 yards a kickoff return, and usually Will Hoyt kicks it out of the end zone. But by design, they've kicked him into the corner and then covered the kick. And Brown has had no time to get anything out of it. Ryan Carl is the guy who's coming on the blitz. Now watch Craig Lumpkin. He's got to block this blitz, and he's got to attack that guy. He can't hesitate on the short pass. Watch Lumpkin kind of hesitate, and then when he goes into the block, it's too late. Carl's already got his hands up. On that short pass, he has to attack that guy and not let him get his hands up in the air. That was a huge play 
for the Tennessee defense. This is where Georgia started the last time, and it cost them. Not this time. Lumpkin. Boy, he's run hard. But you have to play not only within the rules of the game, but also you got to keep your emotions in check. Here's the call. After the play, dead ball, personal foul, grabbing the face mask by the running back, number six. A penalty will be half the distance to the goal, and it will be second down. A lot of make Mark Rick sick to his stomach. Well, he definitely has a hold of the face mask. Now, why he kept holding it, I don't know. It's a good run by Lumpkin. Good, hard, physical run, but just let go of the face mask. And he held it for a good long while and allowed the officials to make that call. That moves him back to the eighth. Lumpkin again, this time not much. Fights forward to the 12, a yard past the original line of scrimmage. A little bounce in the step of the Tennessee defense. Isn't there? Yep, there really is. They got a big play, the first turnover in the ball game. And now they've got him in a third and long situation. Another stop here, and they'll get the ball back to their offense in great field position. John Chavis. Got to be happy with the way his defense has come out of the locker room to start the third quarter. The aggressor. A.J. Bryant is in as an additional wide receiver. He's flanked to the top of the screen. Tereshinsky in trouble. Throws downfield. There's a flag and drop. Massaquah got a hand on it. There was a lot of a lot of hands right in that area, and somebody got one in and helped pull that ball out. Let's check the marker. Well, I'm thinking it was defensive holding against Tennessee. Holding number 24 of the defense. That penalty will be 10 yards from the previous spot. An automatic first down. Dan Juan Stewart, who had the interception on the last possession. And this is a costly penalty because it's automatic first down. As Massaquah tried to break back out, Stewart grabbed the jersey instinctively. And a good call. Here's the end of the play. Joe Tereshinsky running for his life. And that could have been a penalty, too, because you can't hit the quarterback in the head. So Xavier Mitchell, very lucky there wasn't an additional personal foul. Big break for Georgia because it's an automatic first down on the hold. They get a fresh set of downs from their own 22 out of the shadow of their own goalpost. Pressure coming. Tereshinsky throws and throws a complete bullet to Kenneth. Remaining defensive lineman. Not on the field right now for Tennessee. He's the guy who has led the, that defensive line in tackles all year. Lumpkin again, a little stutter step. Right on the inside where McBride came out. And Lumpkin, who had his... Sutherland back in there at the fullback spot. And he'll get the carry. Nice the big call. guy barrels. Fullbacks don't see holes like that very often. No. They don't see the ball very often. <laughs> That's right. He'll get it again. Thing, other side. A couple of yards to the 42. Let's go to Holly Rowe. Well, guys, the big difference tonight for Georgia has been the productivity of their receivers. They have been on target, something that hasn't happened the rest of this year. Mark Greg told us that they haven't really been a healthy group. He said two, the last two weeks when they've really struggled, Muhammad to Bryant, some of those guys, they haven't been full speed, but guys, looks like they are tonight. All right, Holly, they certainly are. They're stepped up big. Lumpkin behind Sutherland. I bet he doesn't grab the face mask this time. No, he didn't. Forced out of bounds by Morley. He's got to use that stiff arm because it's a weapon of his. And this big fullback, and the fullback was able to lead it all the way downfield. Lumpkin now averaging over seven yards a carry. Gets another crack at it. Tries to get outside. Not this time. Yeah, nice play. Nice play by Xavier Mitchell. Fought off the block. Got one hand on that jersey. He was not about to let go. How about 
Scott Sutherland, what a night he has yeah. had. Had a touchdown run of a yard, had another 15-yard run, 27-yard catch, and another catch of eight yards for another touchdown. He's a great athlete. You know, he runs a legitimate 4 5 40. He's one of the most powerful guys in the weight room on this team. Set the power clean record this summer. Second and 13 after the loss. Tereshinsky under pressure. Somehow got rid of it, and Sutherland made the catch, slipped one tackle. But look at the swarm of white and orange coming after him. Tennessee is going to really, uh, they're going to really try to pressure the line of scrimmage now. They know that they're having trouble just lining up and defending the run. They've got to come after the quarterback, and they've got to blitz to stop the run. Not just to rush the quarterback, but to stop the run. They've got to get extra bodies around the line of scrimmage. Third and ten, I wouldn't be surprised to see them go after Joe Tereshinsky again on this play. Try to knock him out of field goal range. Good ball fake by Tereshinsky, intended for Lumpkin. Incomplete in the end zone, and Lumpkin took a shot after that pass was incomplete. So now they'll bring on Andy Bailey, the backup place kicker. They had a shot with this on the wheel route. It's a linebacker, a defensive end, chasing Lumpkin, and he actually dove after it was Xavier Mitchell, who was in coverage. Because they brought a linebacker rush, or an extra rusher, the defensive end had to peel off and cover and did a great job. Andy Bailey, a Tennessee native, has hit one from 22. This is from 34. And he got it. Filling in for Brandon Katu. He'll do the place kicking job the rest of the year because Katu tore up his hamstring. So Bailey will have to do the heavy lifting for the rest of the season. And he connects on this one. Georgia has some breathing room at home against Tennessee. Plasma displays and these great views tonight from Athens provided by the Outback State Ship Steakhouse Airship, not Steak Ship. <laughs> the Bloomin', although that's a great idea, the Bloomin' Onion One. Pilot Tom Whitten at the controls of the Bloomin' Onion high above Sanford Stadium. And if this stadium gets any higher, the blimp's not going to be able to get over it. They got a nosebleed section across the way in the upper deck. It's just about as high as I have ever seen. <laughs> In a football stadium, you need oxygen when you're up there. I guess that's how you get to 92,746. Yeah, that's, that's a great shot. Coker and Taylor are deep. Coker runs up, has to take it on the bounce. Flag is down, so is Coker at 20. 25 yards. Big series for the Georgia defense right now. A chance to really flip the field. Ball's on the ground. And it looks like Tennessee got it back. Not sure Ainge ever got a clear snap no. from center. Remember, Josh McNeil is in there starting at center. It was not a clean exchange. Michael Frog was the starting center to begin the season. He's been out the last couple weeks with an injury. Josh McNeil in there. They're down by their own goal line. This is a critical situation in the game for the Tennessee offense. Ames to his goal line. Swain never saw it. Let's check with Reese. All right, Mike. Missouri going to go 6 and up. Shades of Steve Spurrier. Third and 13. Ainge from his end zone. Wow. Over the middle, that's a big play for a first down. Perfectly dropped in there to meet him for 17. What a beautiful throw. It was third down and long. Ten, uh, Georgia rushed three and dropped eight. And Eric Ainge looked at the screen, sucked the defense up, and then dropped it over the defense, over Paul Oliver to meet him. Watch Ainge use his eyes to suck that defense up and then throw the ball over the defense for a huge first down. Todd, that's a great description of it. That was pretty to watch. Yep. Shows the maturity of Eric Ainge. 
Here comes pressure. It's a screen. Coker. Or Foster, a nice cut to get a couple of more yards. Well, that was such a huge play because even if they don't score now, they've got it out to where when they if they have to punt, they will still have a good field position situation. That third down play with Ainge throwing out of his own end zone, enormous. Oh, boy, both these quarterbacks have played very, very well tonight for their teams. Second and three. Foster again picks his way across the 35 to about the 36. And it was the middle linebacker Jarvis Jackson making the tackle. It's a six-point ball game. Georgia with the lead. And Jackson very slow getting up. Back at Sanford Stadium in Athens, Georgia. Boy, this has been a good one. Number 10, Georgia over number 13, Tennessee, 27-21. Under five minutes to go in the third quarter. Tennessee with a first and 10 at its own 36. Ainge goes to the gun. Short set, quick pass to Meacham. Avoids a tackler to the 40, to the 35-yard line. Well, that's what makes him so dangerous. When we talked to Willie Martinez, he talked about yardage after the catch, trying to keep it to four yards or less. That was the first time where Meacham was able to do what he's done all year, catch a short ball, elude the first tackler, and turn a five-yard pass into a much bigger game. In the Cal game to open the season, both his long touchdowns were five-yard routes where he broke the tackle and ran to the house. He's had three 100-yard games. He's working on another six for 78 tonight. There's a Kentucky red zone alert against South Carolina, if you're interested in that one. Foster breaks a tackle. Hard run down to the 25-yard line. Let's go to Reese Davis. All right, Mike, you just mentioned the red zone alert, Kentucky. <laughs> that was a slow developing reverse. They need to get all the way to the sideline to hand it off. Trickeration. If Steve Spurrier had any eligibility left, he'd have been in on that play. It took so long. Ains batted down. Charles Johnson got his hands on it again. When you Last year, he may not have been able to have done that. He lost 20 pounds this year. He's a lot quicker. He said last season he led the team in loafs. Not this year. Four-man rush. Ains with time. Throws underneath. Not much. Well, one of the big questions was how would Tennessee in this game be able to handle the rush, the pass rush of Quentin Moses and Charles Johnson? They've done a great job. Aaron Sears is playing a little bit banged up. Eric Young, the right tackle. Those two tackles have done a good job on these two defensive ends for Georgia because I think as a pair, they're as good as anybody in the country. But Tennessee has done a nice job of keeping them off of their quarterback, Eric Ames. Third down success against third down success. Strength against strength. Big play here on third and six. Ains, pressure coming, watch the screen, and then has to desperate throw over the middle. The screen was beautifully covered, couldn't go anywhere. Well, it was a blitz by Georgia. They haven't blitzed a lot. Then Daniel Ellerby is the guy coming on the blitz, and Ames trying to throw that as he was backing away from the pressure, just not enough, able to get enough on the football. Will Hoyt, veteran kicker, who has missed only once this year from 42 yards. And he's made 14 of his last 15 going back to last season. This is the 37-yard try to cut it to three. Perfect. Will Hoyt comes through, and we have a three-point ball game again. Steve McDare, Ray Lewis, and the Ravens are off to their best start in franchise history. Monday night, they go against Jake Plummer, Javon Walker, and the Denver Broncos. It's Monday yet, Monday Night Football on ESPN at 8.30. Also available in high definition on ESPN HD and in Spanish on ESPN carried by that brilliant defense. And I mean, it is, they got one point maker another on, yeah, yep. on that group. Let's check in with Reese. All right, Mike, put our finger on the primetime pulse. The game's going on in the... 
Well, Reese, I'll tell you, some of these uniforms yeah. are really an assault on the census. Yeah. You know, that Cal team, I think a lot of people were ready to write them off after the way they got beat handily by Tennessee in the opener, but ever since then, that's a good football team. They just uh, had some things go against them quickly in that game. They're a very good football team. Tennessee, of course, has only one loss this year, and that was a one-point defeat at the hands of their one of their arch rivals, University of Florida. California came in ranked ninth in the preseason polls, and Tennessee just jumped all over them. I think that's why Philip Fulmer felt they might have an edge coming into this game. They've played two really high-quality opponents, whereas for Georgia, this is their first real test against a, a top-10 caliber team. Starting from the 20, Lumpkin behind the fullback, Sutherland. And now Tereshinsky changing the play. He's been very successful in this situation so far tonight. And one of the things that they thought was the key to him starting instead of the youngster, Matthew Stafford, of the other youngster, Joe Cox, guys who have seen considerable action this year. Yeah, it's just his... His awareness, his everybody getting along and working well together. It's a good situation the Bulldogs have. It's highly unusual to have three guys as they whistle this one dead. If you're going to play three quarterbacks and you're still undefeated, that doesn't happen very yeah. often. Mike Bobo is the quarterback coach now under Mark Rick, coaching the three guys that have started this season. So he knows how this works. Good protection for Tarashinsky, and he gets the completion to Milner. Mark. All right, Holly, thanks so much. I want to stay on top of that. Martrez Milner took a shot right in the thigh on that last play. Tereshinsky on third down. It's intercepted. What a pick. What a catch by Jonathan Wade. He ran a better pattern than the receiver. Well, he was reading it. Georgia loves to throw the slant, and he waited and came right under the route. Massaqua didn't do a great job of keeping the defender behind him. See, he got baited. Jonathan Wade let him come in there too easy, and Massaqua should have felt something's not right letting me come in this easy. And Wade came right underneath it and made the pick. The senior gets the interception, and Tennessee has a chance to tie or take the lead. And Ainge wants to go for the throat. To the sideline and Meacham comes down hard. Evans with excellent coverage. And Meacham really hit the ground with that effort. Well, that's a case of, a, of an offensive coordinator, David Cutcliffe, trying to go for the jugular here. You just got a big pick. You got good field position. Go play action. Try to get a big play. Ouch. But Georgia not fooled. I mean, they're such a well-disciplined defense. They're very rarely out of position. Meacham trying to clear the cobwebs. It's a big weapon to have on the sideline. Ainge again with all day to throw. Got it to Smith, who has had a huge night. And Smith has a first down inside the 15-yard line where Jarvis Jackson, the middle linebacker, got him. But it's a gain of 22. Smith now with a 100-yard night. And we have reached the end of the third quarter of the three-point game. Scoring has gone. Tennessee getting some of that second-half momentum going. They're down by... And they are driving. And they are protecting their quarterback, Eric Ames. They've thrown it 30 times. They've run it 20. Georgia can't get to the quarterback. Coker. Well, they got to him for maybe a loss of a yard. Here's how these teams have done in the fourth quarter coming into this one. And it's a huge differential. Georgia plus 41 in the final stanza. Tennessee is minus one. Georgia has got to find a way to harass Eric Ainge because he is a hot quarterback who has had too much time to find open men in the passing game tonight. Ainge with time. One more time. Wide open. Meets him. Touchdown. 
How does one of the leading receivers in the nation get that open? Well, the safety is going to get caught looking inside. Meacham's here. He's going to run to the corner, but watch the safety get caught on the inside receiver. Brett Smith, who's had a big night, he's the guy who draws two defenders this time, and Keelan Johnson got frozen by the inside receiver and left Meacham alone in the corner. That was an easy throw for Ainge. You remember we talked at the beginning of this ball game about how important it would be for Georgia to get pressure from its front four. They did a pretty good job very early in the game. Not lately. They've not been able to get to Ainge, and he burned them that time. Aerial shots tonight, courtesy of our friends at Outback Steakhouse. Proud sponsor of the Outback Bowl. The Outback Steakhouse airship, the Bloomin' Onion, provides aerial coverage of sporting events all across the country. And thanks for being with us tonight. Beautiful night here outside of Athens, Georgia. Eric Gaines with that touchdown pass that has put Tennessee on top. Boy, he just looks so different than he looked last year. I mean, David Cutcliffe has done a wonderful job with him. Hasn't he? And the kid has made a commitment as well. Morley from the three. Only to the 16. Look at what's happened in the second half. Joe Tarashinsky, the interception off the deflection by Antoine Stewart. That led to a touchdown. And then they had a great opportunity on a good drive for a touchdown, but an overthrow of Lumpkin, who was working on defensive end, they had to settle for a field goal. Next time, another interception by Jonathan Wade. This led to a Tennessee field goal that made it 27-24, and then the Ames touchdown that put Tennessee on top for the first time tonight. And against the number one scoring defense in college football, coming into tonight, Georgia, 31 points now and three quarters of play for Tennessee. And now it seems every time Georgia touches the football, they're backed up inside their own 10. In the second half, their average starting spot has been the 11. Check in with the Reese. All right, Mike, Kentucky and South Carolina on 24-17. Well, they've been in a couple of close ones, haven't they? Kentucky's better this year, that's for sure. Yes, we they saw are. them earlier. They're better than they were a year ago. Georgia desperate to get something started on offense now, and Tennessee's defense is getting better and better as this game wears along. I'll tell you, one of the best things that Tennessee has done tonight, they gave up the punt return for a touchdown with poor coverage, but their coverage of kickoffs has been very, very solid. And again, usually they've kicked the ball out of the end zone for touchbacks, but by design, they've kicked it high and short into places and they've done a great job of putting Georgia in bad field position after their own kickoffs. The last four drives, Tennessee's defense has taken the ball away twice and given up only 89 total yards. We're going to cut loose on third and eight here as Tereshinsky goes back to his goal line, throws to the sideline, a lot of contact. They're saying it was an uncatchable pass. There was contact. Massaqua was covered by Wade. And Georgia, believe it or not, will punt for the first time tonight. Gordon Neely Kelso will come on. He's number one in the conference in punting. Hefty will go back to return it. Snap and it's blocked. Live ball in the end zone. Touchdown, Tennessee. They had two blocked last week at Ole Miss. A high snap, pressure off the edge, right over Craig Lumpkin. Lumpkin is the guy that's going to be the responsible for the block. Antonio Wardlow, wow, came through to get the ball. 
Last Dang. week, Ole Miss blocked two. One of them was called back because of a penalty that would have been a touchdown. The other one counted and led to a field goal, and now another one tonight. Didn't it look like Ely Kelso was very, very slow, yeah. especially after having to go up and get that high snap. He was very casual about it. And it cost him. Tennessee has exploded. 31 points in less than 18 minutes. ESPN College Game Day. ESPN's College Football Primetime. Brought to you by Mercury and your local Lincoln Mercury dealers. And American Airlines. We know why you fly. We're American Airlines. Located on the north campus, just where it meets downtown, that's the arch. The legend says if you walk through that arch as a freshman, you will never graduate. Glad I didn't go here. I don't walk through it the first day. <laughs> What a second half for wow. Tennessee. I always saw a huge special teams play by Georgia in the first half that swung momentum their way. Now a huge special teams play by Tennessee in the second half to swing momentum even further their way. Five penalties, two turnovers, a block punt, and 24 points given up in the second half for Georgia. Everything had just come apart at the seams. There goes Thomas Brown. Look out. Turn and an 86 yard punt return for the dogs. And we just got done talking about how well Tennessee had been yes. covering kickoffs by kicking it short and to the corner. This time they kicked it deep down the middle, and Thomas Brown took it to the distance. Wow. Now Georgia will go for two to get it back within a field goal. Tereshinsky goes into the gun. That's Massaqua in motion. Looking his way, Tereshinsky now throws right between receivers. The closest man to it was Miller, but he couldn't turn around in time to get it. Well, you know that Georgia's offense had to respond. But in, here's Wardlow. This is not even a full all-out rush, but Craig Lumpkin just whiffed on the block, and Wardlow not only got the block, but recovered it for the touchdown. And the reason that you said Ely Kelso looked like he was a little slow, he realized this was not an all-out rush. He had a high snap. He didn't think there would be pressure, but Craig Lumpkin did not do a good job protecting the left side. What a turnaround. Special team. Oh. Huh? Well, we said special teams when Holly was talking yeah. at the beginning about the injuries to Georgia on the field goal kicker. How much special teams have played such a huge part in results this year. And for tonight, have they done it again? And still, look how much time. 12 minutes and 34 Ooh. seconds left in the game. A lot of football left to be played here tonight. Just saw DJ Shockley down on the sideline next to Mark Rick trying to encourage his former teammates on. Tennessee trying to answer Coker. Look at this. Got another blocked in hit from behind out to the 45 <laughs> yard line. Brian Evans, a red shirt freshman made the tackle to save an even bigger return. DJ Shockley, he was the starting quarterback last year, and this is just, man, who's going to have the ball last? Coker has done a nice job all night returning kickoffs. I mean, he is an explosive guy with the ball in his hands. What well, nice pursuit by Evans. He missed the initial tackle 25 yards back downfield. Got up, got back in the play, made the tackle. 
This is already the highest scoring Tennessee Georgia game ever. And they've been playing forever. Foster. Tennessee still not really able to run very well against Georgia, but they've been able to protect their quarterback. Let's go to Reese, the Sports Center 30 at 30 update. All right, Mike, amidst the excitement, Canyon getting a knock here. 3-1 the final. They still trail the series two games to one. Wall-to-wall -wall complete baseball coverage on Sports Center as soon as you guys are done. Ainge back to throw. Plenty of time. Got it to Smith again. What a huge night he's had. Yep. Brett Smith had 13 catches all year coming into this ball game, and tonight he already has eight. Georgia goes with the blitz. They have not been able to get to Ainge. They're going to bring linebacker pressure. Instead of rushing four, they bring six. That means man-to-man -man coverage, and Brett Smith is working on a linebacker. That's Brandon Miller, number 12, who's in man coverage against the slot receiver. Again, slot receiver in the middle of the field has had a big night for Tennessee tonight. And how about the end of it? One bounce right yep, back into right his back stomach. Yeah. Looked like a point guard. Eight catches, 123 yards for the senior wide receiver who has been in the shadows because of the success of Swain and Meacham. Not tonight. Saturday, nothing. Georgia has challenged the last call of a completed pass. And as you'll be able to see on the replay, the ball is bobbled, but was it caught first? Brett Smith bobbling it all the way, and then it's popped out by Brandon Miller, and it comes right back up into the, to the hands of Brett Smith. But the question, did he have possession at any point? Now, this is a coach's challenge. They are allowed one per game. They have to use a timeout to get the challenge. If the challenge is upheld, they get the timeout back, but they lose the challenge permanently. Here's the call. After review, video evidence shows that the receiver never controlled the ball. Therefore, we have an incomplete pass. It will be third down and eight at the minus 47. He got one step. Yep and appeared to have possession of the ball for one step. What they're saying is that's not enough. Well, and I think it's the right call. I don't think he had clear possession of the football. He's bobbling it the whole way. It was unlike the one we had earlier in the game that was ruled in George's favor where he did have possession before he hit the ground and the ground caused the ball to come out. That's a huge break for Georgia's defense. Because sure is. That was a first down in scoring territory. Now it's third and eight back on their own side of the 50 for Tennessee. That's an enormous play. Tennessee wants to drive again the way they have been doing the entire second half. Can they keep the drive alive? Four-man rush. Ainge finally pressured. Throws on the run. Complete Meacham. What a great job by Eric Gaines. And then Meacham is hit out of bounds. And the Tennessee sideline is really upset that there was no flag right in front of them. Well, you know what? They're upset that there was a flag, but there was a guy on the Tennessee sideline that knocked Battle down. Great job by Ainge stepping up in the pocket. He never had an, a, a desire to run. He kept his eyes downfield. You see the physical nature of Meacham as a receiver. 220 pounds, six foot three. And uh, boy, a great conversion on third down. Coming in, the best in the conference at converting third down. That was a huge one there. They have made tremendous plays in the second half. And Ainge has just been sensational. Now they go to the tight end, Chris Brown, 250 pounder. And that third down play was the first time that they really got some legitimate pressure on Eric Gange, but he adapted to the pressure. He stepped up in the pocket, kept his eyes downfield, and made the big-time throw. Great reaction. Tennessee now approaching 300 yards. Georgia already over that mark. And Ainge is thrown for 224 of those yards on 22 of 34 passes. Foster. Big hole up the middle. 
Foster down to the 24. So all those great scoring stats are out the window yep. for the Georgia defense. Well, Philip Fulmer was right. At halftime, he told Holly, I don't know if they can stop us. I mean, I, we, we've got to figure out how to stop them, which they've done by interceptions. But I don't think they can stop us, and they have not shown an ability, Georgia, to stop Eric Ainge in this Tennessee offense. They've only run for some success, but they've done a great job of protecting the quarterback, and Eric's been hot. Ainge under a little pressure this time, throws down to the five, Smith! Wow. Dives, and they're saying he's short. About a foot from the goal line. Smith just having an enormous night. Again, Georgia goes with pressure. They bring extra pressure. Tony Taylor on the blitz. Ainge under duress. Fires a perfect throw to Smith in the middle. Georgia has opened up the middle for the Tennessee receivers, and it's that slot receiver, Brett Smith, who has done the most damage. Well, I'm not so sure this wasn't a touchdown. First and goal. Ainge, quarterback, keeper, no signal yet. Ainge, second down. Gordon is a pile up like that. There is a fight for the ball, whether it was initially fumble or not. We got to protect the football right here if you're Eric Ames. You got to secure the snap, first of all. And again, you've got a new center, Josh McNeil, who wasn't your starting center when you began the season. He's a freshman. So you got to secure the snap, and you got to protect the football if you go quarterback sneak again here on second down. Foster is the tailback. He'll get it. Flag is down as Foster dives into the end zone. Now we'll check the marker. Tennessee says it's against Georgia, and it will count. Are they right? Offsides. Number 90 on the defense. The penalty is declined. Touchdown. They are. And it's 44-33. to People that tune into this one will think we're in overtime. We're not. It's still the fourth quarter. These are all legitimate scores. These are not the overtime six-pointers. Will Hoyt will come on for the point after. I missed that. Boy. I mean, how many missed extra points can you see in a weekend? 44-33. Back to Georgia after this. This is a Before the start of this ball game, as you see the score 44-33, Georgia's defense was leading the nation in scoring defense, 6.8 points. They've given up 44 tonight. The average has nearly doubled. Well, and we said this would be the greatest challenge, the first true offensive challenge that they've had. And, uh, Tennessee has looked awful sharp throwing the football. Here's Thomas Brown. They're going to avoid him with a short pooch kick because he went 100 yards the last time he touched it. Marcus Washington ends up bringing it back on the short kick. Let's go to Holly. Well, guys, DJ Shockley is here on the sidelines, and it's ironic how his career is really mirroring Joe Tarashinsky's. He told Joe just after that that quit worrying about that missed two-point conversion. He said Joe was down about that, concerned that it was not going to put them within field goal range, but it doesn't matter now because Tennessee scored. So he told him, get over it. You'll get at least two more offensive possessions, and what you do ahead of you is more important than what's behind. It's a great way to look at it, Holly. Thanks. Lumpkin the tailback behind Tarashinsky. They want to scream, but Lumpkin has no chance because Wade, the corner, came up and did a great job. He's had a, some big plays tonight, has the senior. That was made by Wade. Tereshinsky would have been better off to throw that ball into the ground. Jonathan Wade is one of those seniors who, uh, from Shreveport, came in, in a, as a wide receiver, has got all the skills. As you take a look at Joe T's numbers, much more effective that first half. 
This one is behind Massaqua. And once again, it's Wade right there. You can see the confidence in this Tennessee defense far greater than it was in the first half. Well, they did a better job in the run. They created some turnovers in the second half. They've pressured Joe Tereshinsky. And right now they've got Georgia in more of a situation where they have to throw because they're down by 11. Well, then here's the question. Do you go with Matthew Stafford, who is obviously the better passing quarterback? Well, we've not seen him yet. If they don't get anything in this drive, we might see him in the last series, or the next series, I should say. Four-man rush. Tarashinsky with time. Being hounded, throws, complete. Great throw. What a job by Tarashinsky. Finally found it. Yes, it is. Tereshinsky. Kept it alive, kept it alive, kept it alive. Finally found somebody. Tennessee showing blitz, and he wants to change the play. The third-generation Bulldog trying to lead his team from behind. Oh, Under pressure again. That's Knocked away. Loose ball. Tennessee. Marvin Mitchell, the middle linebacker, came on a blitz. Knocked it away. The recovery made by Gerard Mayo, the weak side linebacker. The third turnover in this half. And credit Mitchell. He got there. He came on the blitz, chased down Tereshinsky, knocked the ball out. And then held Joe T's arms down so he couldn't recover the fumble. The arm came forward, but the hand no longer controlled the football. Now they're going to review it anyway. It was ruled a fumble, so it is a reviewable play. Remember, in college football, everything... Every play is looked at by the replay official. That is why it is such a great system. Georgia has called timeout to review the play. The play will be under further review. Now watch Tereshinsky. Ball is knocked loose before his hand comes forward. Well, I'm a little confused here because if, if Georgia challenged the last play, which I guess we need clarification on that one, you're, you're only supposed to get one challenge per game. Now, they do get their timeout back. They get the timeout back, but they don't get the challenge. So I guess we just need to verify for sure whether the last reviewed play that, that took away the completion by Brett Smith, whether that one was a, re, a challenge by the Georgia bench. Well, this is straight up at it when they started to challenge. So they said, you don't have to use it. They didn't bother telling us that, <laughs> but that's what they told the sideline. So they actually had a challenge left and were able to use it here. I think they're going to lose it. Yeah, but they had it and they had to take a chance after review video evidence supports the call on the field. It was a fumble. It will be first and 10 for Tennessee. Timeout. Timeout Georgia. But there's a little hitch in the system. They need to let us in on it. If if they're not going to charge them with a challenge. This is quite a turnaround. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I did not think Tennessee was going to be able to come back because Georgia had so much momentum and they had played so well. But hats off to Tennessee. Well, their defense, they created turnovers, and those turnovers inspired the whole team. You know, the offense started clicking. Eric Ainge has been very hot, but it was the defense sure forcing turnovers. The turnovers have been the story in the second half. That set the table for Eric Ainge and the Tennessee offense and took the steam out of Joe Tereshinsky and the Georgia offense. And, of course, this is such a big game in the SEC East because Tennessee had already lost to the University of Florida 21-20. And the Gators win again today. They're 4-0. Georgia comes in 2-0. Look at Tennessee down at 0-1. They could ill afford to lose this one. If they go on to win, they're back in it at 1-1. And, and Florida will be the only undefeated team right now in the SEC East. Yep. I'll tell you, you really have to tip your hat to 
Philip Fulmer and the Tennessee coaching staff because this is a team. I mean, they lost a heartbreaker to Florida. That was a game where they had a 10 point lead in the fourth quarter and lost at home 21 to 20. And last year, I don't know that this team would have been able to rebound from that. I mean, they, they struggled last year. Right. This is a new team. I mean, they have really changed their attitude, their approach, their toughness. And they were able to bounce back from that heartbreaking loss. And they are playing better football now than they were in September. Foster is the tailback on this series. Tennessee would just like to work on the clock. Foster's actually going to lose a yard as the clock goes inside seven. Sports Center, of course, will follow our broadcast here. Tennessee is down two scores. At minimum, they would need a touchdown, a two-point conversion, and a field goal to tie. Well, you can't say enough either of, of the job that the two tackles, Aaron Sears and Eric Young, have done against Quentin Moses and Charles Johnson. Yes, sir. That, that was one of the key matchups. How would they block those guys? And Georgia has not been able to generate pressure with their front four the way they have all season against Tennessee. Haynes wants to throw underneath to Cottom, and the tight end will have a first down before he goes out of bounds. At the Georgia 33-yard line, Brad Cottom, the junior tight end at 6'8", 260. That's a pretty good target, isn't it? Yeah, it's a big target crossing the middle of the field. You'll see him go right in front of the face of Eric Ainge, working on a linebacker, Brandon Miller. Eric Ainge doing a nice job of finding the right matchups and throwing the ball with accuracy. Now this, this Tennessee offense leaning very very heavily on the pass very similar to the way they did it when peyton manning was a senior back in 1997. And that's because of david cutcliffe the then and now offensive coordinator Boy, look at the numbers on Ainge. 258 yards passing he's hit two-thirds of his throws 24 out of 36. Back in 97, when Peyton was a senior, Tennessee averaged 181 yards per game more passing than they did running. And coming into the night, this Tennessee offense was averaging 163 yards per game more passing than running. And I bet that ratio is just about exactly the same here tonight. That was a good run, that last play by Arian Foster. But for the most part, Tennessee has done their damage throwing the football. Was Peyton Manning fun to watch? Mm -hmm. Still is. I mean, the most prepared, the most diligent guy I've ever been around. He was just ready for anything. Let's go to Holly Rowe. Well, guys, Peyton Manning still comes around Tennessee. He comes down every summer and throws with these quarterbacks. Eric Ainge said the most important thing he told him this summer about his new offensive coordinator, David Cutcliffe, just keep your mouth shut. Don't say anything. Do exactly what he tells you if you need any proof look at my brother and me he is the reason for our success guys Eric said that it been a lot to him to hear Peyton say that and he has done that and learned how to trust Buttcliffe boy it's really worked Ainge plenty of time to out in the flat that's incomplete when Cutcliffe went to the Manning home to try to recruit Eli he was convinced he was going to go to Tennessee and he had already gone to Mississippi he said Archie Manning was in the room. He said he was the best parent he ever had to deal with because he knew more and said less than anybody he was ever around in that situation. That's a great family. You know, it's interesting to me because in watching Eric Ainge, I mean, he looks a little bit like those two guys. Yes, he does. And his mechanics right now, his footwork, he's quick in the in his setups, the way Peyton and Eli were, keeps that ball high. Inside the 10, the ball came loose when the receiver hit the ground. That was Lucas Taylor, and he was popped by Tony Taylor, the linebacker. But they're going to say he's down, and that should be enough for a first down. Well, you just have not seen very many throws off the mark tonight by Eric Ames. Down, and the ball comes out. Good call by the officiating crew. See, Georgia's desperate. I mean, they've got to try to create a turnover, try to rip that ball out. They've not been able to stop Tennessee's offense. Sellout crowd here in Athens, Georgia, number 10 against number 13. Just a huge game in the SEC. A lot of questions for both ball clubs. Some answered tonight, some will still be up in the air, but certainly Tennessee's resiliency 
but their ability to come back in a tough situation on the road is not in question at all. No. Foster inside the five. And that's when you know you've got a team that's come of age. When they can come in to a hostile environment like this, really have it laid on them in the first half, and then turn around and come back. Well, and you go back to that score right before halftime that was so huge because it was 24-7 Georgia, and they had complete control of the game, and Tennessee was able to mount one last drive before halftime. They went to, for the fourth down and made it instead of going for the field goal and eventually got the touchdown to make it a 10-point game. And they got the turnover right away in the third quarter. But that touchdown right before halftime really gave them a, a charge for the rest of this game. Second and goal. Look at all the time they have eaten off the clock. Foster down near the one. Of course, I'm sure the Tennessee coaches are going to be really upset with their special teams. Even though they got the one punt block for a touchdown, they gave up a punt return for a score and a kickoff return for a score. And if you're going to do that, somewhere down the road, it's going to burn you. They've already taken four minutes off the clock on this drive. Been over 10 years since they gave up 50, and that was to the hated Steve Spurrier when he was in Florida. Foster to the outside, dives for the goal line, touchdown! Right in front of the linesman, he extended that arm and got the ball over the plane of the goal line. His knee may have been down before that ball got across, too. Close. Mm. We're seeing some fatigue on this Georgia defense yes. right now as well. Tennessee is really grinding it on them. We're going to take a look at this before the extra point. But it's, I think, academic at this point. They have really ground down Georgia, and whether they scored or not on this drive, they've taken so much time off. Well, that's a touchdown. I stand corrected. He got the ball out there before his knees or his offside arm hit. The hand doesn't count, by the way. Tennessee's last six possessions, they've racked up almost 300 yards. Wow. And they've scored on all of them, a field goal and five touchdowns. Georgia's had no answer in the second half. Well, Ooh, I think this, back yeah, Tennessee, it will be. It? And I think this game shows a couple things. I'll wait for the call here. After review, video evidence. Supports the call on the field. Touchdown. I think this game shows, number one, that uh, Tennessee is probably worthy of a top ten ranking. Yeah. And I think it also shows how good Florida really is. That's Florida it? to go into Knoxville right. and beat them when they were down ten in the fourth quarter shows that that's a pretty good football team down in Gainesville as well. And Florida has been going through a brutal stretch, and we will see them next Saturday night at Auburn. What a game that ought to be. Our game track, Tennessee, with three touchdowns off of the second-half takeaways. Their defense has gotten turnovers. Their offense has taken advantage of it. And they have racked up the Georgia defense in the process. When you play a big game, special teams, turnovers become huge. I mean, Georgia had control of this game, and the turnovers in the second half did them in. Not to take anything away from Tennessee, because they came out in the second half and took the game over. There are the six drives we told That's you about. The last six times they've had the ball. Touchdown, touchdown, a field goal, and three more touchdowns. Yikes. And most of that throwing the football. I don't even think they've run for over 100 yards, have they? Tennessee, I don't know that they've run for over 100 yards tonight, but they have thrown the football incredibly well. They've protected Eric Ames. They've run it enough yes. to, to make the Georgia defense play honest. 
but they've not been able to generate pressure on Ainge. And even when they did get to him, he still threw the ball accurately with people in his face. Well, the point you made earlier, the offensive line, particularly the tackles, did a whale of a job for Tennessee. Yeah, I mean, just tremendous. I guess Tennessee did run for 106. They've run for tonight. So just enough to make them be honest. And they're going to make sure that they don't kick that ball deep and give up a big return again. Sports Center coming up after the game. Neil Everett and Stan Verrett standing by. They'll have a rundown of all the top 25 scores and highlights. The SEC literally turned upside down today, and the Tigers eliminate the Yankees. You don't get what $230 million used to get you. <laughs> well, good for Jim Leland. And the Detroit Tigers had a great year, and they get to keep playing. Didn't he do a super job? And the party at the Steinbrenner House is going to be a little subdued tonight. Matthew Stafford now in the ball game for Georgia. Probably a little too late at this point, but this is a very talented youngster out of uh, Dallas, Texas, Highland Park High School. Big time recruit, and he is blasted as he got that pass thrown to the sideline. And he is one of the three uh, freshman phenoms, really, quarterbacks yeah. in the SEC this year. Tim Tebow down in Florida, I think, threw a couple touchdown passes today. Mitch Mustaine, he's yet to lose as a starting quarterback at Arkansas. A huge win in Auburn today. And Matthew Stafford, the three of them, uh, very, very highly recruited guys all in the same league yeah, supposedly the top three quarterback recruits in the country they all end up in the southeastern conference and all have seen some action this year Mitch Mustaine at Arkansas again a huge win today Matthews one of the leaders on Florida's team as a true freshman proved this afternoon he threw a jump pass <laughs> He looked like he was double clutching in the lane, trying to get a uh, five foot jump shot, and it worked. Goodman made the last catch. Clock showing only 210. And a disappointing night for Joe Tereshinsky. It started out well, seven of nine sure in did. the first half, throwing the ball with great accuracy. Still pretty decent percentage, but the turnovers, two interceptions and a fumble. Really did the team in. And there's another Stafford turnover. got picked on the tip, and it's intercepted by Hefney. That is his third pick of the year, his seventh of his career. And when you come in at this time as a quarterback, or even if you're just somebody who's staying in there, this is so tough to complete anything. Well, the Marvin fourth, Mitchell got the tip, yeah. the middle linebacker. Fourth turnover for. Georgia tonight, all in this half. And that's been the difference in the ball game in the second half. The any, any coach will tell you, you know, some coaches like statistics more than uh, others, but they will tell you the one that all of them pay attention to is turnover. Yep. You win that battle, you're going to win most of your ball games. The defense created the turnovers, and the offense took advantage and moved to football. And now Tennessee has no goal but to run out the clock. Coker is back in. He'll get that carry. Alabama, South Carolina, and LSU, the only one ranked right now, LSU, but they're four and two. Then at Arkansas, and a couple of weeks ago, who thought that might be a right. huge game? Now it looks like it's really huge. And then Vandy and Kentucky. Kentucky certainly better than they were a year ago. They might surprise somebody else before this season is over. And Vanderbilt beat Tennessee last year. Well, this is going to be hard to swallow for the Georgia faithful. They were so hopeful coming into this game, and especially after the uh, first two quarters. Why not? I think they had dominated this game. <laughs> Yeah, he's a happy man, and he yes, should be. He is. You know, I mean, it, they were five and six last year. He had all kind of problems with his quarterback situation. He had, you know, some splintering in the team, and uh, and they really focused on team this year and rebuilding that team and accountability. And uh, 
things that Mark Richt has done here at Georgia as well. And boy, it's just it's great to come on the road and get a win like this for Philip Fulmer of Tennessee. Great poise. It's a huge win for Tennessee. Hats off to the balls who came in here, were dominated physically in the first half, found a way to get a late score, and then came back in the second half and just turned everything around. Final score, Tennessee 51, Georgia 33, the highest scoring game ever in this series. Sports Center coming up next over on ESPN News. It's the post game extra. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For Todd Blackledge, Holly Rowe, and our entire ESPN crew, this is Mike Patrick. Good night from Athens, Georgia. Thanks for watching, everybody. points against the nation's top scoring defense but we'll do our best welcome to sports center i'm stan Verrett along with neil everett you know neil you take a look at the baseball playoffs and you realize 200 million dollars just doesn't seem to go as far as it used to no hey, we robert money in the bank new york and its enormous payroll and a huge spot a must win at detroit yankees scoreless in their last 14 innings jeremy bonderman first postseason start top two gets gary sheffield who went 0 for 4 with two k's bat and cleanup jarrett wright on the other side he's had some postseason starts in fact game seven of the night leslie jordan as our entertainer for the evening. oh you sarah things turned out perfect anyway as the game over. Jamie Walker gets Cano to ground out to end the series, and the Tigers are rocking in the Motor City like it's a Nugent concert. First time since 1987 that they advanced to the ALCS when they lost to the Twins in five games. Jim Leland kissing the dude's hat. Real thing. Smokey and Ugo, there was no doubt who the big dog was by the end of this one. Eric Ainge in a 3-0 game finds Brett Smith, his third receiver, balls up 7-3. The Bulldogs take a 10-7 lead when Mikey Henderson fields the punt on his own 14. Good night and good luck. Mikey Henderson's going to house it, and the Dogs have a 17-7 lead. And then, Mark, Joe Karashinsky's back. He finds Brandon Sutherland. And Georgia at this time had everything going right. Nice job by the offensive line, the play-action pass. And Cherish just fires the ball in there, and he pulls his way into the end zone. Hunker down at a 24-7 lead, but Tennessee would come back. 24-14 game when Eric Ainge cuts it to three, and then Lou. Ainge got warm finding Robert Meacham. Oh, he really got, after being down 24 to seven, Tennessee scored about 40 points just on great throws like this. Control both sides of the football. 25 of 38, 268 was Ainge, and then the volunteer special teams got in on the action. Antonio Wardlow blocks the punt. Vols recover for the touchdown. But on the ensuing kickoff, Georgia will not go away. Having to rely on special teams, downtown Thomas Brown. Mr. Brown is out of town. 99 yards. Dogs missed a two-point conversion, still within five. For the Georgia defense, number one in the nation in scoring defense coming in. Averaging giving up less than seven points per game, and they got shredded by Eric Ainge, who found Meacham over the middle for 20. Five plays later, they had finished the drive with Arian Foster going over the top. The balls hang half a hundred plus one on Georgia. 51-33, Eric Ainge was brilliant. It says that we won one game and that we got a whole bunch more SEC games to play. It's the toughest conference in America, and we know that that's just one win. It kept us in the hunt, but that was just one win. But it was one big win, and it's a win that's going to turn Georgia's defensive statistics upside down. The points, the yards, the passing yards, everything just ballooned against the ball. And Tennessee was perfect in the red zone, inside the 20, six times, six touchdowns. That's absolutely remarkable. They got 27 first downs in the game and came back from a 24-7 deficit reminiscent of the rally against LSU last year. Glad to have you with us on College Football Final, powered by Pontiac, alongside Lou Holtz, Mark May. 
I'm Reese Davis. You know, not many upsets so far this season. September, in fact, we'd only had one top 15 team beaten by an unranked team. Fewest since the preseason polls started in 1950. But can you feel an upset coming sometime? Well, if you're coaching, you can sense it on the field. I mean, you're the other teams beating you to the punch or controlling the line of scrimmage. And you just feel, boy, we got to get into halftime. You come out the second half after five minutes of the second half. If you're still in trouble, you need somebody to make a big play or else you're going to get upset. You're almost to the halfway point of the season. You can almost sense upsets out there. So it's pay attention to detail. It's the little things you have to take care of. Well, Tommy Tuberville was thinking about the big picture. He spent some time talking about the need for a playoff in college football. SEC too difficult. Tennessee and Georgia, it was wild. It was worth watching. Good highlights and a lot more next in sports. You're watching News Channel 9 Weekend. Here we go tonight in Athens, Georgia hosting Tennessee. Big game. And this is QB Eric Ainge finding Brett Smith 15 yards out. TD, Georgia's 3 to nothing lead evaporates at 7 to 3, Big Orange. Late in the first, the Bulldogs recapture the advantage when Brandon Sutherland pulls home from one yard out. It's 10 to 7 Bulldogs. Second quarter, get ready for a mighty big play. By the dogs, Mikey Henderson hauls in the punt. He has some running room, a lot of running room. He's not going to lose the uh, football this time. 85 yards. It's 17 to 7, and Sanford Stadium is going wild, as one can imagine. Georgia's next possession, there's more. Quarterback Joe Tereshinsky, who really had a pretty good game, looks for Sutherland again, finds him eight yards out, 24 to 7 dogs, and Big Orange is in deep heat, but never quits and comes back. Early in the fourth, Ainge finds a wide open Robert Meacham. Where's the D? 15 yards. Tennessee now has the lead. Moments later, maybe the big play of the night. The dog punt is blocked. Antonio Wardlow falls on it in the house. Oh, touchdown balls. Big Orange would never lose that lead. What a game. What a comeback. Tennessee wins it, wins it big, 51 to 33. The Bulldogs are undefeated no more. Now five and one overall. The Vols are five and one as well. It's Alabama in two weeks. Wow. Auburn today. How about the unbeaten and second-ranked Tigers hosting Arkansas? Pick it up in the first period.